all of us, right, in every part of our daily lives, access to affordable, clean, and reliable energy is an essential human right. So it's actually in our state constitution in Hawaii that it is a part of the public trust resource. So just like water, um, we have every right to um, protect uh, renewable energy sources, just like uh, our sources from sun, water, and air. Um, we need to protect them, um, protect our water streams, protect our energy, not privatize it. It's an essential human right. All right, I'll pass it off now to Clara to talk about our, how our grid works. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everyone. So for today, we're going to be covering more of like a bird's eye view of how the Hawaii's energy system works with a focus on key points related to energy justice. And so our, our intent is not to give you a technical understanding of how the grid works, but rather how the energy grid impacts communities. So starting with the fact that our islands have a series of independent grids and each are responsible for producing their own needs. And so on the right side, you can see that right now we have two major utility operators. One of them is Hawaiian Electric, which is investor owned for profit. And it was built throughout the 19th century and our first colloquium went over its history. And so make sure to learn how some of Hawaiian Electric's founders also had a role in the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. And so we can drop a link in the chat about that. And the other major um, utility operator is Kauai Island Cooperative and they are not for profit and they're run by an elected board of members. So one of the biggest problems we face is how expensive our electricity bills are. And Hawaii has the highest rates for prices in the nation, almost double the average. And that's because electric rates include a combination of utility construction, operation costs, and fuel costs. And so HECO, which is a regulated monopoly, asks the PUC for approval to recover the cost of building and operating its power plants and wires from ratepayers. So they make a profit margin on the money that they invest. And so that means that rates are high because one, our utility relies on imported oil, which is expensive and um, the prices are constantly changing. And two, because the utility traditionally has little incentive to control costs because the more that they build, the more they profit off of it. And so now for the next slide, um, before we get into the energy facilities on each island, let's take a moment to distinguish between clean and renewable energy. And so in 2019, the renewable portfolio standard was published and it basically dictates what sources of energy are allowed to go on the grid. But unfortunately, um, their definitions of renewable and clean energy weren't very clear about um, what is renewable and what is clean and how they impact the type of energy future we can create. And so our definition for um, clean energy is they come from zero to minimal emission sources, such as um, solar, hydro, and wind energy. And then for renewable, they come from sources that are technically naturally replenishing, but flow limited. So examples of this are trash incineration and biofuels. And so neither clean nor renewable energy are perfect. Just because a development is clean or renewable it does not mean it won't have major consequences on the natural environment and the residents hosting these facilities. And that's where um, equity and justice perspective is really important when planning these things out. And ideally, we should choose the path of least harm and what suits the needs of the communities, not a corporation or shareholders that make money from large utility scale projects and a centralized grid. So now um, on to the next slide about sources currently available in Hawaii. We have solar, wind, water, geothermal, and biomass sources. And some special considerations should be made about biomass, trash incineration, and renewable gas, which um, give off different levels of pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions. And as you can tell, there are quite a few options for us, and there are plenty more. And this is just to give us a sense. So looking at all these options, we really need to have a holistic approach that includes many voices and perspectives. We need to have a holistic um, approach that um, over these perspectives, especially those directed impact, um, directly impacted by energy projects. 
And right now we have decisions being made by just a few people and are beholden to shareholders that don't deal with the everyday consequences of their decisions. So they're not making these decisions based on how um, the community is actually gonna be impacted. And so now I'm going to um, hand it over to Lucy to talk about the overall landscape of each of the islands. Yeah, thank you, Clara. So that's it. those are all of the um, types of power that we have on our islands. So now we're gonna look at where those are located and talk a little bit about some of those specific projects. Um, so these are gonna be the landscapes and kind of through adjustive perspective. Um, just like we learned at our last colloquium, the placement of power facilities have consequences on the Aina and the residents nearby health. Um, so that means makes where we put these really important decisions that we're making. Um, so it's important seeing the location of power facilities, how it highlights the disproportionate burden that has been placed on rural and low income communities of color who live who lie, who's, <laughs> who live in those areas with little to no direct benefit from those systems. Um, you know, we got an example of that last colloquium when we talked to the folks from Kuhuku, how the Kuhuku windmill projects, most of that power wasn't going to that community and those wind turbines were closer than ever before um, and they didn't approve of those projects. And oftentimes by the time the community is considered, it's already a done deal. So they don't have a chance to reject that project. You know, most of our energy on Oahu ends up going to Waikiki and to tourism. And yet we don't see the energy systems being placed in those communities. We see them going and disproportionately impacting other communities. Um, similarly, to that is Hawaii's last coal plant in West Oahu, AES Transports. Um, hopefully you can get someone to highlight where that is. Um, uh, they transport toxic coal ash to the PVT landfill in Nanakuli, um, where it is used to blanket the day's trash, which is harmful to the workers and surrounding communities' health, as well as coal being bad for the environment in a multitude of ways. Um, so the landfill is closer, close to 750 feet from the residents. So has a huge impact on them. Um, and like they also shared at the, by the Kuhuku folks, um, no one is against renewable energy. And because we know the severity of the climate crisis, it's gonna be really important. But energy justice requires a holistic approach where everybody is considered um, and talked to before these projects are done. Um, and it's important to also see how land usage can impact food security and affordable housing and reject underlying issues of environmental um, racism and sacrifice zones. So next we're going to move on to um, Hawaii Island. So continuing on all of this, um, I realize most of our audience is from Oahu. I think we might have one or two people from other islands. Um, so that's why we're going to spend most of our energy there but we want to continue building this to be for all islands so we will briefly go over them something to highlight on Hawaii Island um, are a couple problematic projects like Hohon Ho 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 Hohonua biomass facility where they're burning trees to create energy which contradicts um, the need of trees for carbon capture there's actually currently a supreme court hearing going to shut them down um, uh, the, what's unique about Big Island is also geothermal energy, which basically digs deep holes into the ground to pump hot water that turns into steam. Community residents have fought it for decades, raising concerns about the ecological and cultural impacts of it. Um, but ultimately, there are still three of those. Um, so next slide, we're going to move on to Maui. So Hawaiian Electric's grid on Maui is unique because it covers a few of the islands. So Molokai, Lanai, and Maui um, are all through Maui Electric, which is a substary of Hawaiian Electric. And on a positive note, we want to point out that there's something happening on Molokai. Um, so as you can see on Maui, there's mainly solar, wind, and then oil. But something that's happening on Molokai is a cooperative that is currently in the works um, that's being organized through grassroots um, support, community partnership, um, and the developers trying to create a community scale and owned power facilities, as well as 
plan for their entire island to run off responsible, sustainable, and culturally compatible energy. So next month, we're actually going to have them attend our colloquium to talk a bit more about that and what some energy solutions are. So next. So moving on to Kauai, even though it it has its own um, Kauai Island Utility Cooperative. It's important that we keep an eye on what they're up to and hold them um, accountable. So right now Kauai is run by 56% renewable energy with a goal of being, it being 70% by 2030. So that means there are some key projects underway to make that happen. One in particular is major AES hydropower project in West Kauai, a rural working class community. So it is advertised as a brand new technology, but as we know, AES is not a company we can trust. You know, they have the coal plants, but they also were part of the um, Kuhuku Windmill Project. Um, so it's important that we keep watching them. Uh, so, um, so it will use a low grade agricultural land to house solar, which will then generate power from an industrial sized hydro pump that will pump water from a nearby reservoir up to the mountain to the, another reservoir where it will flow down triggering hydroelectric system generating power. So it's estimated to use 11 million gallons of water a day. So obviously this is raising a lot of red flags for the community, um, especially about water rights issues. And it's important to note that even though it is a cooperative and they do have a lot of renewable energy, their prices are still extremely high. So I'm actually gonna hand it off to Sarah to talk about energy burdens on communities. Awesome, thank you so much, Lucy. That was a great overview of all the islands. Um, so as we've shared earlier, our current energy system is set up in a way which the economic burden is unavoidably high. So in Hawaii, the, the cost of electricity is 116% higher than the national average. So there are a few different definitions of energy burden, um, and there's two ways that we're gonna be using it. So one is the amount of income spent on energy costs like electricity. And according to the US Census 2000, from 2011 to 2016, the national average energy burden for lower income households is 8.6%. That's three times higher than non low income households. So the families with the least among us are spending much larger percentages of their income on energy bills than families with more resources, not just. So the other burden is the disproportionate direct impact that energy projects have on communities. For example, Kuhuko. So this is tied to the racial and economic injustices and environmental racism that have historically been a part of the fossil fuel economy and that got us into this climate crisis. So I wanna, um, I wanted to quickly share this quote from an article called Racism is Killing the Planet by Hop Hopkins of the Sierra Club. So he said that if climate change and environmental justice are the result of a society that values some lives and not others, then none of us are safe from pollution until all of us are safe from pollution. So dirty air doesn't stop at the county line and carbon pollution doesn't respect national borders. As long as we keep letting the polluters sacrifice black and brown communities, we can't protect our shared global climate. And all of us are equal and deserve equal, you know, parts of this planet. No one is, you know, supposed to get more than one and we're not supposed to be hurting others. So that's why we're here to talking about um, justice and equity for our energy system. We're living in an unprecedented moment where our systems are being forced to change and the profit motive corporate ownership and the top down approach um, got us into this crisis and we obviously can't depend on this same system to get us out of it. But um, there is another way. So that gives us to the next slide. So, right, that sounded like a whole lot of bad things about our energy system, but to, uh, and to end this top-down approach, we need to equip ourselves in a vision for locally sourced community-driven energy systems. And there are so many options available to us. So don't let that, last slide dampen your mood we have options for example rooftop solar residential and commercial buildings put solar panels um, uh, to generate their own power and honolulu actually has one of the highest rates of rooftop solar adoption and according to the uh 
of Hawaii State Energy Office's 2020 annual report, rooftop solar has the potential to contribute up to 40%. 40% of Hawaii's projected electricity needs if all homes and 20% of commercial buildings participate. Only 20% of commercial buildings. Um, microgrids, um, these are self-sufficient energy systems that serve a distinct area, such as a college campus, hospital complex, business center, or neighborhood. Um, a hybrid microgrid is one that would connect to the grid, but can kind of island itself right when it needs to. Um, and then you also have these off the grid microgrids that are completely sovereign, self-reliant um, and can take care of themselves. Um, another option we have is community owned solar. Um, so this would allow people to um, go solar even if they can't afford the panels or maybe they don't have um, their own property or roof if they're in a, an apartment building like renters or those who are in shared buildings. So, um, that's another great option. And finally, our community-based renewable energy, um, AKA CBRE, is an actual program through Hawaiian Electric for people who can't install rooftop solar, but still can participate by subscribing to energy output of a CBRE project like Solar Farm. So they get a credit which reduces their bill, but if communities wanna create their own project, Hawaiian Electric will still own the infrastructure. But Anyhow, this isn't the full list either. There's continuously um, new technologies that can really benefit a distributed energy system. And because of the, a lot of the projects we shared are raising issues because of how large they are, taking up so much land, some of which is agricultural land or not, it really intersects with our food system and affordable housing. So instead of depending on a whole bunch of large industrial scale solar farms, what if we mostly rely on rooftops, uh, rooftop solar or community scale projects? and then just have a few industrial scale ones. The fact of the matter is that Hawaiian Electric traditionally has little incentive to control costs um, because the more it builds, the more it profits. And ratepayers are the ones paying for the construction through our rate system. So this brings up a great question. Who really owns them? Um, now, uh, I also wanna transition into different kinds of ownership because we're really just used to this privatized system. Um, so if we go to the ne this next slide, we can see um, there are multiple kinds of ownership systems. We have investor owned utilities. Um, so this is the status quo. It is profit driven that we have, we've seen been getting in the way of building an energy system that works equitably. Um, fortunately, there is a lot of work through the Public Utilities Commission to change how they make their money. Um, there's cooperatives. These are um, systems where they're governed by their members who are also the customers. We also have public power utilities, which can be state or county owned. And there's also hybrid options of this public power utility as well. And finally, we have this standalone. Um, it's a nonprofit or social enterprise with an independent system. So this, um, I just want to end by saying this might all feel overwhelming because there are so many alternative options and this isn't even the whole list. But that's the point. There are a variety of ways that we can make our energy system work um, in a way that's gonna benefit everyone. So we're already taking the first step by showing up to learn today. So it's through our knowledge and passion for change that we can come together to start the energy revolution and make energy an essential human right. All right, thank you. I'll hand it off to Lucy so we can start our breakouts. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. So, yeah, so based on everything we shared so far, we kind of want to take a step back and participate in a fun exercise of energy democracy with you guys, you know, be able to have a discussion on everything we just talked about. But for a little bit of background, back in 2015, Hawaii passed a law to have 100% renewable energy by 2045. So unfortunately, we are nowhere near that goal. Oahu gets almost 70% of its energy from oil. Um, and the climate crisis is here. And our utility provides our paying us. Um, having only one energy provider. 
Um, so in these breakout rooms, we will share ideas and dream about what our energy future could look like. You know, how do we want to get to our 2045 goal? So we are going to be using Jamboard for our breakout. So I'm going to share my screen. That's our presentation.